Hey guys, Bradley Hallman here. Welcome back to the channel. Yes, this is another co-angler series video. A uh, huge response off the very first one that went out there. Um, lots of comments, lots of feedback. And um, I thought I would take that opportunity to really use the second video in this series to address some of the questions that you guys had. It makes it very easy for me um, to sit and edit and go through a video that you guys, I'm basically just answering your questions. So um, I kind of went through the last video and, and handpicked some of the questions out there that I thought would really help serve the overall group of guys. So each video of the co-angler series is designed to try to help each one of you guys become a better co-angler or a better angler overall, no matter what your experience level, if it's your first time uh, fishing a tournament in a pro-am situation or if you've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, guys, once again, leave the comments below on this one. We'll get back to you. Uh, bump the like. Hit the subscribe, guys. We put a lot into this videos, and uh, damn it. All right, guys, I told you I wanted to talk about some of the situations that we get into and how you can adapt to them. And some of this is by questions that you guys send in as viewers. And I had some really good questions off the last episode, so I really wanted to include some of them in this video right here. Um, this video, right, this uh, question right here is from Todd Greenwood. He put uh, one thing that has really changed things is live scope. Any tips if the boater is fishing isolated brush with live scope? I found that <clears throat> I found that to be the biggest challenge over the past two years. Once the sun comes up, usually I just drag a Carolina rig around, but that has been tough, especially when the fish when the fish are tied to the brush. Um, I will say that live scope has definitely changed the back 180. Um, and it will continue to change because now there are more companies coming out with forward viewing technology, right? Lowrance just dropped one. Humminbird's supposed to be dropping one. Um, they work and they're a big advantage to have for, for the boaters. It is something that you don't have out of the back of the boat. Um, we joked. So here's an idea. Here's something that no one's done yet, but we've joked about this. Um, a co-angler having his very own unit. You know, they make a, uh, Garmin makes a ice fishing a live scope series, you know, so that those guys that drop holes through the ice can drop a live scope down and you could sit back there and live scope. Um, that is a possibility to live scope off the back 180. Uh, I hadn't run into that. I hadn't seen a guy do it. I hadn't heard anybody talk about it. And um, it does sound silly, but I wouldn't put it past anybody because uh, I could see where it would work, especially where if a guy was sitting in one spot a long time and just throwing to a brush pile in front of him. Um, live scope in general is just going to make things tough. Um, I know they are because it gives the boater more confidence than what guys had had in the past that weren't as good with their electronics and GPSs to understand, you know, angles of throwing and things like that. I mean, um, it really helps them stay out there longer on some offshore structure or spots. Um, I can give you some tips and ideas, the things that will help you. Um, you know, a lot of times brush piles or offshore targets are not the only thing there. There's usually more. Um, especially if they're like crappie piles or something like that. If you're in the south, those guys tend to put multiple brush piles out um, by fan casting the back 180, you know, everything around you. Um, you can hope to find something out there. Um, if you're sticking out over, you know, deep water and it's just, you know, they're throwing up on top of a ledge and got, you know, where you, you, the back 180 is really just out over the main river channel, then that really creates a problem. All right, this is a question from Coangler Culture. I have a question in line with your first examples. I was paired with your friend Dale on day two. He's talking about Dale Hightower, who's an Elite Series guy on uh, Neely Henry. Uh, we mostly fish shallow banks uh, by takeoff. Uh, you recall seeing us. Uh, yeah, and I did. I stopped to talk to Dale a couple times that day. What would you recommend to throw? I cranked behind him and tried to flip as he was throwing a chatterbait. Um, really stings as I had a chance for the top 10, but couldn't, couldn't crack the code on how to get a bite. Uh, any help would help in this scenario. So co-angler culture, what I would tell you is, is that I do recall that day perfectly well. This was uh, day two of the Bassmaster Open on Lay Lake. And um, we were fishing Water Willow up river, um, not too far down from takeoff. And I actually had my best day of, of the event that day. 
I ended up catching 14 or 15 keepers a lot. Um, Dale also had a decent day uh, throwing a chatterbait. I was throwing a chatterbait a little bit, but most of my fish came on a spinnerbait. You, you probably heard me say that when I pulled up to Dale, I was talking about that. Um, if Dale's throwing a chatterbait, a little spinnerbait behind him would be a good follow-up bait. Also, flipping that water willow would have been a really good option. Anytime somebody was throwing, because this was a water willow on a river system, and um, Dale was going down it with a chatterbait, and I don't know exactly how his boat positioning was, but I imagine it was a little bit off the edge, and uh, flipping the outside edge, also the middle of that water willow with some type of plastic bait would have been, would have been a really good change up to go to all day long. There was a lot of fish caught down through there and um, throwing some plastic up on the edge of that grass really, really could have been productive. I know that I caught my best fish of the day, almost a three and a half pounder um, flipping at the end of the day. Just those same grass places that I'd caught them with a, with a, with a spinner bait, a chatter bait earlier in the day, I caught them flipping. So, Definitely flipping if I'd have been in the back of that boat flipping stick and then maybe following his chatter bait with a spinner bait But for the most part if, they, if there's a fish there on a, on a point of grass or a little sweet spot and a chatter bait comes by It's not too often that a fish is going to say ah, I don't want to eat the chatter bait But then crush the spinner bait, but it could happen I mean you, you could try it for a little bit there could be something to that But more than likely it's going to take something a little bit different presentation such as flipping while he's covering water with a horizontal moving bait all right, here's another live scope question. This is from uh, Bobby Burgess. Hi, Brad. Uh, what if your partner is fishing ledges in 52 to 75 foot, which that is extremely deep. Um, he's throwing a drop shot with the Garmin live scope, so he's probably fishing vertically on top of them. Um, he's using it directly down at them, and, and uh, you being me, fishing from the back deck uh, of the water with no electronics and 52 to 75 foot of water is unknown. Uh, please answer because that stumps me. Um, this one's going to go back to the question about electronics in the back of the boat. Uh, some of the pros turn the electronics off and, and I personally do not do this, but I know that a lot of them do. A lot of boaters do this. They, they turn the back electronics off. They, they give you some excuse about how it runs their battery down. We'll get some more damn batteries, but um, to stick a guy out there in 60, 70 foot of water and he can't see anything at all on the electronic, um, that's, a bad, that's a bad day. Uh, what I will tell you is, is, is the countdown system. Um, this is something that I learned a long time ago. I use it every day to this day. Uh, when I make a cast with a jig or something like that, and that's where I learned it was football jigs years ago, um, I wanted to know where I was getting bit. So I would, I would cast my football jig out and then you know, give it a lot of slack so that it falls straight. And I would start counting the instant that it hits the surface of the water, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And I was doing this in my mind. A three quarter ounce football jig basically falls about a foot a second. That's about what it falls. And um, whenever that bait would land, you pull it a couple times and I get a bite, I would know, hey, I got bit in 17 foot of water there. Or I got bit in 22 foot of water over there. Or that cast over there I thought was going out to 50 and it stopped at 10. So that, that point runs out further than what I thought it did. Um, those were things that helped me tremendously. It became habit to the point that I didn't even think about it. Literally would fire over there thinking I was throwing into 50 and would be like, wow, that's only 10 foot. And I wasn't consciously thinking about the counting process, but I had done it. Um, from the back of the boat, when you have no idea what you're throwing at and what you're throwing around, the counting process, no matter what fall rate you have, is extremely important. Um, if you're, even if you're fishing in the middle of a water column, I would suggest that you're counting. So if you're throwing a swim bait and you want to count it down to 20 feet, you know, let it fall to 20 count or 25 count before you engage the reel and start reeling. And then you know that that cast is at 25 or 20 foot. And then the next cast you count, you know, to 30 and let it go further. And the next count, cast you let it throw, go to 35 or 40 before you start reeling. So the counting process can really, really help you in the back of the boat. I mean, you're, you're, you're giving yourself better odds to at least know that you're covering the water column, you know, just from what you know, just from counting. It's, it's, it's pretty simple and it does work. Here's a question from Rob Treasure. What do the pros do if you get snagged up? If you're throwing far out the back of the boat, do they go back and get it or do they make you break off? Um, I would say the first few times probably go back. 
a lot of this has depends on what you're throwing, right? So if I was throwing a shaky head out of the back of the boat, some type of lead and worm or something like that, I'm not asking it all throughout the day. I'm just breaking, breaking, breaking. And I'm making sure that I bring plenty of them. That's part of packing my tackle. Um, if I'm throwing crankbaits, a jerk bait, like I said, the mega bass, which I'm going to avoid throwing out of the back of the boat because I don't want to draw somebody that just refuses to go back and get it. Um, I'm trying to just stay back there in my back 180 to where I'm not being very high maintenance to anyone around me, if that makes sense. So if, if I've got some baits on, worms and stuff that I can break off, I'm breaking them. Um, if I've got a crankbait or something that I really want to try to go back and get, then, you know, like I say, a couple times during the day, it's not a big deal for most guys. Um, but there are some guys that flat out aren't going back. I, I will say this too, a lot of that probably has to do with the tournament that you're fishing, you know, something that was once like what the FLW Tour was, those guys not going back. Um, but they've got $5,000 inch fees and a lot more invested in the, in the day um, financially. Whereas a BFL, you know, there may be guys go back six, seven, eight times during the day. But I will tell you that six, seven, eight times is getting on the excessive side. Do you leave the grass on for your co-anglers? I hear some boaters turn them off. Not sure if they are doing it to save battery, eliminate some interference, or to be turds. Uh, good luck this season. Love to share a boat with you someday. All right, Jason. Um, I personally do not turn my graphs off in the back. I leave them running all day. I've also got three batteries, three 12 volt batteries tied in line, parallel in session so that my stuff's not going dead even if the aerators start running at the beginning of the day and we go all day long. Um, a lot of the guys turn them off and then they say they use the excuse that it's, it's keeping their batteries. Um, you know, this is one of the parts I'm talking about. They don't have any rules. So, you know, can they turn it off? What's their boat? I mean, I guess they can. I know a lot of guys do. I'd say probably 50% of them do. Um, it makes it tough. But if you, if you use the countdown system that I was talking about, um, you can kind of, you can make up some ground with the countdown system. You know, you throw a bait out there, count 1,001, 1,002, and whatever it hits, that's kind of the depth. Um, and then it helps you get around. So, um, but yeah, guys are definitely turning off their grass. It does happen. Um, I, you know, you can try to have that conversation in the boat, but I, I, I don't know where that ends. All right, I got a question from Skeeter ZX225, and he basically describes a situation where he's in the back of the boat and he goes into a cove with his boater, goes into a pocket, fishing the left hand side of the pocket, throwing a buzz bait. He's really, really shallow. He's hugged up to the bank, parallel in it. And he said basically behind the boat is just a mud stream. And so he starts casting. His, his options are to either throw in the mud stream behind the boat or to turn and cast out to the, towards the middle. So he decides to turn and cast out towards the middle. Um, as they get further back in this pocket, the pocket begins to narrow to the point where he can actually reach the laydowns and the cover on the other side of the bank. Um, he says that his boater gets very upset and unhappy with him at this point and stops the boat and complains about the fact that he's going to fish that water on that side on his way out. Has a similar situation, what he's talking about happened to you, uh, would you be so kind to give your opinion on this matter? Okay. Um, yeah. So this is a common deal too. Um, we call it cross creaking is what it's called. You know, um, some co-anglers, you know, a lot of guys that are inexperienced, they, uh, they get in the boat and they think that, and, you know, the boater doesn't realize, hey, I can just throw over here and then I'm getting clean, clean green grass, right? Um, they realize. They know what's going on. That's what, that's what we, call, we, we call it cross creaking. Um, it's been going on forever. Is it legal or is it not legal? Um, like I say, there's no rules. Is it an unwritten rule? Man, this is one that I really think is in the gray. And this is my opinion on it, okay? Um, if you, if you go into a creek situation, what I'm talking, a true creek situation, you know, where guys are fishing creeks, I mean, it's really hard to tell a guy not to flip the other side of the creek, right? Um, it's hard to tell a guy not to cast where he wants to cast. So if, if a guy's following that line that, that kind of, you know, runs that, the console of that boat, you know, where he's staying behind you, he's not throwing in front of you, he's not pushing you all day, um, it's very hard for me to tell him you can't throw over there, right? Because 
if you think of that console as being a line or whatever, or just, you know, he's staying behind you, um, even though he's throwing, he's staying behind that line. That cast is behind that line. So this is, this is what I think. I think that as the creek starts to narrow, he should be able to position the boat in the middle of the creek. And he should be able to cast them both in front of the boat in 45 degree angles, right? So if he wants to hit that one or hit that one, that's what he should do. Um, meaning it would force you to throw in front of him to be able to hit those laydowns. So therefore, for him to tell you that he doesn't want you to throw to that side, I think is wrong. Um, I don't like that call. I do, I do know about it. I do know that there's a lot of guys that feel that way. I mean, Tommy Biffle would come back there with a pocket knife and cut your line off and probably threaten to stab you with it if you did it. But um, this ain't 1975 anymore. And, um, you know, like I say, if guys are fishing behind me all day anyway, why am I trying to handicap them even more? I mean, no, the answer is no, I, I don't like that. Um, like I say, my boat, me personally, I'm going to position the boat differently. I'm going to come back towards the center of the creek where I can cast in front of the boat at 45 degree angles and hit both sides of target. So if there's a really pretty lay down on the left, my spinner bait's going to be able to go over it. If there's a really pretty lay down on the right, my spinner bait's going to be able to go over it. If I really want to go flip that lay down on the right, and I want to flip the one on the left, but I haven't been able to yet, it's just part of it. I mean, that's, that's the risk or chance that you've got to take because the, he's going to have the right to throw at it. You know, like I say, as long as it's behind the boat or, you know, behind the console, um, I think that's hindering way too much. Carly J, have you ever had a co-angler just not interested in fishing but more interested in learning just sit and study what you were doing? How you retrieve certain baits and how you cast to skip under docks? Um, I personally haven't had too many that I felt like were just, I mean, I've definitely had some that were definitely more interested in learning than they were fishing. Um, but I will tell you a story. Um, this was a long time ago. The Central Pro-Ams were up in the Missouri area and going, and they used to have winter tournaments, and they were Pro-Am style, obviously, the Central Pro-Am. And there was a lot of really good fishermen from that region that fished that circuit. And they had tournaments in the wintertime, in December and January, when nothing was going on in Oklahoma. And this is whenever I was really ate up with fishing, um, before I was on the Elite Series and was trying to learn and get as much as I could. And a friend of mine, Wes Endicott, and Mark Jeffries on the Bass Talk Live uh, fished the Central Pro-Am as boaters, and I called Wes Endicott, and I, I said, hey, man, I'm thinking about fishing this tournament up there in December on Table Rock. And he was like, yeah, man, I got a house. Come on, come stay with us. Da, da, da. And I said, well, I think I'm going to fish as a co-angler. And he was a little bit taken back, but I explained to him my reason. It was like a $50 entry fee. They were two-day two tournaments. And that meant that for $50, I was going to get two chances to draw one of those guys that was really, really good on the Ozarks. And I liked that opportunity. You know, um, I was going to learn. I wasn't going to catch fish. I wasn't going to learn spots. I was going to learn just to see how some of those guys attack that clear lake. And uh, me being from Oklahoma and more about, you know, stained water, I wanted to see how that would work. So I go to the meeting. I draw out with none other than Jim Aikens, designer of the Aikens jig. And um, he was a really good fisherman, him and his son both up there in that region at that time. And um, I drew out with Jim and I actually showed up at the boat dock in the morning. Imagine this, a co-angler. I had, I had one rod, one rod in my hand. I had no tackle. I had nothing, just a rain suit on. So picking up a co-angler off a dock with one rod in his hand, can you imagine that scenario? Now, I did have a pocket full of jigs because I knew that's what he was gonna go do all day. And I was already ate up with that jig anyway. Everybody in this part of the country was. And I was just giddy to get to fish with him. But I can honestly tell you that I spent most of that day um, standing on the front deck, which you can't fish from, because I didn't have a rod in my hand. Um, I went to learn and he caught a 21 pound bag of smallmouth that day. It was second or third um, bag of the day. And I watched him catch that bag out of 30 foot of water. It was a tremendous learning experience. Uh, fast forward two years after that, and I took that same technique that he had taught me to Lake Norfolk in Arkansas, another Highland Reservoir in that same general area in September, and led that event, a BASS Bassmaster Open, um, basically doing the same thing that Jim had taught me. So 
It was, it was extremely beneficial, right? So you're asking the guys get in the boat to learn? Absolutely. There's guys that get in the boat to learn. Um, I learned a huge lesson from Jim Akins, and I wonder to this day, I don't think I've ever talked to him since, I wonder if he still remembers the coingler that crawled in his boat with no tackle and one rod in his hand. That's got to be. You would think that would have stuck out in his mind. <laughs>